Hey everyone, in this video, we want to talk a little bit about pregnancy, nutrition, and exercise because as nutrition and fitness nerds, uh, this was an area that gave her a lot of anxiety um, <laughs> because she wanted to make sure she was doing everything right to you know, build the healthiest baby that she could, build, build a bear workshop. <laughs> um, oh my God. That's what came to mind when I said that and build a baby build anyway. Build a okay. Yeah. Have you heard that song? No, no. Sorry. We're getting way off topic. Okay. okay. Anyway, uh, nutrition exercise. So I'm just going to pass the ball to her. She doesn't want me to do that because she like freezes, but, um, let's start with, let's start with exercise. Cause that one's easy. Yeah. So, um, I have a history of hypothalamic amenorrhea. Uh, I had it for 10 years. If you don't know what that is, that means that your reproduct your reproductive function shuts down because you're over exercising, right? Yes. Uh, doesn't really matter if I'm eating enough calories. If I don't have enough body fat, I just my body says no. So I didn't have a period for probably eleven years through my twenties, beginning of thirties. I I, I'm just I talking okay. to you. I thought you were asking me. Like I don't, I don't know, <laughs> something like that. I guess. <laughs> anyway, you got it back though when you got into New York, right? And you started yeah, eating a bunch because, of food. Because I was dating and a bunch of men were feeding me food. I was still training, um, just not at the same intensity. And I gained body fat back. And so I, I've been functioning ever since. Um, so the point of that is, is I have to be very careful with exercise because my body shuts reproductive function down easily. I did not exercise the month we did an IUI at all. That was <laughs> um, tough. Very hard. With that said, I get 20,000 steps a day. So it's not like I'm sitting on my ass when well, I- Well, even that, you, she had to dial that back too. Yeah. She was aiming for like 10,000 <laughs> steps a day, um, which she gets half of it on her morning walk alone. So yeah, it, it, was, it was tough. I yeah, think. I, was, I was getting 20,000, not 10. You were? Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were aiming for 10. What am I thinking of then? I have no idea. Okay. Well, just ignore me then, everybody. This is why I passed the ball to her because I just don't have a good memory of this whole experience. My first trimester, I dropped down to like 12,000. Okay. Maybe that's, maybe what, that's what I'm thinking of, thinking of then. Yeah. Um, after I started getting sick and I was really tired, then I dialed it back. But as far as exercise, I was very scared. I did not start exercising again until 10 weeks. This is not necessary. Like when I'm working with a client that is pregnant or trying to get pregnant, I do not have them stop exercising if they have enough body fat and that's what they've been doing. And that's what your doctor will tell you too. <laughs> you could do everything you could do before, right? Yeah. And so that's pretty much the gist of it for exercising as long as you're not rock climbing or bungee jumping like biting. Yeah. And I, That's the gist. you don't want to put a lot of compression, uh, compression pressure on mm -hmm. your abdominal region. So like when you're pregnant, you know, you can still do squats and stuff, but you can't like load up the barbell. Like you would have, you can't have all of that weight pushing down. Some people do. <laughs> I, I won't do that. Um, I'm too paranoid. Yeah. Same with like doing heavy deadlifting. Basically you just I don't want to do a bunch too. of, you don't want to do a bunch <laughs> of heavy stuff. Like yep. you can still lift and move around, but you don't, yeah, the I started goal isn't to crush yourself. 10 weeks. Um, that's probably 10 and a half, right? Yeah. It was after I felt safe and I was still very nervous. I mean, I was like texting Sumi while I was doing it. It's like, is this okay? I'm feeling a lot of like tightness in my abs. Yeah. <laughs> when and, I'm doing a leg press. <laughs> and there's a lot of benefit. One of the reasons that, that this whole thing happened is because there's a lot of benefits to exercise during pregnancy. You know, your babies come out leaner, faster, uh, the stronger. The placenta grows bigger, and so it has more nutrients supplied to the baby. It's just a healthier baby. Yeah, the baby gets more nutrients, but it doesn't the turn into uh, to bigger, uh, uh, more fat mass. It turns into greater lean mass and like organ, organ and all of that. Um, less likely to be complications during pregnancy. Uh, and it makes the birthing process easier because the uh -huh. mom maintains better cardiorespiratory and muscular fitness. Yeah. So definitely want to be hypertensive. Yeah. You, <laughs> you definitely want to be exercising during pregnancy if possible. Yeah. Unless there's 
like bleeding, that's the big no, no. Yeah. If you're bleeding, then you need to stop and call your doctor. <laughs> yeah. And there are, there are people who that literally get put on bed rest because their bodies are just saying no, like any activity at all. And we're, we're shooting this thing out. Yep. My, mine doesn't respond. It's not responding like that. And I think a lot of that is because I'm staying on top of my nutrition. Um, I started tracking calories the moment I started well, hold on, exercising. Hold on. Yeah. Well, this is a good transition to yep. nutrition, but did you show them this? Yeah. You did already? No. Oh. <laughs> I meant, yeah, yeah, I'm going to. Okay. This is the book. It has really bad pictures, but it's an excellent book. I love it. What's it? Exercising, Exercising through, pregnancy. through your pregnancy, second edition by James F. Clapp and Catherine Cram. Yeah. James Clapp has a bunch of studies. Like he's uh, looked into this extensively on PubMed. You can go look at his studies too. I link people to him. Cool. All the time. So yeah, it's good but reading material. <laughs> okay, so let's transition this to nutrition. So she eats like every two hours. Yeah, that was, um, so I have a past of like eating for leanness too. And so this has been a complete diet overhaul for me. Um, the month leading up to my pregnancy, I added back more carbs. I, I'm not a huge carb fan and it's not because I don't like carbs. I mean, I eat carbs but I don't like crave them like other people. <laughs> like it's very easy for me to go too low carb without realizing it. And my me, blood markers like show it. Let me, let me expand on that. She, she just prefers to eat like fibrous vegetables and fruits. For taste. Like that's yeah, just what that's, like. that's her dietary preference, which automatically pushes out other things like grains, Starch. legumes, starchy tubers. So she gets carbs, but she doesn't get a lot of digestible carbohydrates. Yeah, I eat okra unless, at night, but yeah, like un other than that. Unless, but she doesn't, she's not actively avoiding them. See, that's the differential. Like if we were to go out to eat, you know, she'll eat pizza crust. Uh, bread. She, yeah, bread. Like, uh, like when we have fajitas, she'll eat the little... Uh, Corn tortillas. Tortilla. Uh, I, don't, I don't avoid them, but I just don't crave them in my day-to-day -day life. So I had yeah. to do a huge like dietary overhaul because I think low carbohydrate diets are horrible for baby development. <laughs> yeah. Like horrible. <laughs> well, and I mean, it, it's not great for fertility either. No. So that's the thing too. I had very low fasting insulin. Um, it was around two. Like I, I have a really hard time getting it higher than that. Uh, but I did the month I got pregnant, it went up to three, which is good because insulin sensitizes luteinizing hormone. Right. Yep. Um, and I think that's why I got pregnant the first month too. Yeah. And we're not, we're not trying to, to poo poo on low carbohydrate or ketogenic diets. They work for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, if it's helping you, for example, go from an obese body comp to a normal body comp, that's going to benefit your fertility more than anything. Um, I, I still think people have issues if they have certain like polycystic ovaries, Yeah, like you have high cortisol anyways. Mm -hmm. And if you start a ketogenic diet, we're not talking low carb either. Like, I think low carb is very beneficial for someone with PCOS. Yeah. I, uh, I have a bunch of books on this too. You're just, you're talking about like near zero, like, like ketogenic keto. dieting. Yeah. Like that's just, it's just more stressors on your body that you don't need when you're trying to get pregnant. Yeah. And so, I mean, if it works for you, then, you know, it works for you. We aren't going to challenge that, but for a lot of people, it, it doesn't work. Um, so yeah, so she oh, basically, yeah. you jump to, to eating more carbs, eating more frequently, like eating every two hours too. and eating, well, more calories <laughs> overall. Yeah, so I had to add more fat too. Um, anything like novel that you did with your diet or that you noticed really helped with like any of your pregnancy symptoms yeah, or anything? So in the beginning, um, I didn't have a ton of nausea, uh, but when I did, uh, starchy carbs, like were the only thing that <laughs> stopped it. And that's usually because, uh, morning sickness is from low blood sugar. And so if you need some carbohydrates to boost it up. Yeah. So a little slow digesting complex carbs then, huh? Yep. Uh, what else? Um, I'll mention protein during pregnancy. Uh, the uh, National Academies of Health um, for the RDA of protein, they literally said the baby requires like 20 or 25 grams of protein per day in its growth and development. So we're just going to take how much like 
the RDA for, for a healthy woman and just slap on that extra protein, which means that the RDA for a pregnant woman goes from being like, what is it? goes from being uh, 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight to like one or 1 1.1 grams per kilogram. Um, it's stupid to be blunt. And we actually have methods using the indicator amino acid oxidation technique that show that the RDA for a pregnant woman in the first trimester is closer to 1.67 and in the third trimester, 1.77. So about 1.8 grams per kilogram body weight, just all around is uh, a more accurate estimation of how much protein most pregnant women need throughout pregnancy. Yeah, I, I probably weigh more than that. Yeah. Uh, I, I have never had a problem with getting protein. <laughs> yeah, and this- Well, I guess I did when I was- If, if you're coming from a fitness background, you're, you're just eating one gram per pound of body weight, you're solid, just keep doing that. Um, yeah. If you come from a different background where you haven't really been paying attention to your protein, then this is probably going to be a lot more than, than you've ever eaten before. Yeah. And I think it's important to track if you've never tracked, even if you're pregnant to get a baseline of where your nutrients are falling, like in something like chronometer. Yep. Um, I, I supplement, I stopped a lot of my supplements too, when I got pregnant, because there's a lot of stuff not tested in pregnancy and I'm erring on the side of caution, mm -hmm. but I do, I do take like prenatals. I take double the amount of fish oil that I was taking just because I tested my micronutrients and my fatty acids before I got pregnant and they were low. Um, and DHA or DHA, DHA is very important for the developing fetus, especially yeah, for their brain. Fish now <laughs> I hate fish, but yeah, it's for the baby. Yeah. We have a bunch of salmon and halibut in our freezer. Um, any other nutrients? Choline is, so yeah, choline. choline, DHA from fish oil. Ideally, you'd be eating plenty of leafy greens to supply lutein, which is important for the development of the retinal tract. Yeah, it's, it's very hard. I, I tell people just to eat what they can in the first trimester because yeah. the food aversions are really bad. <laughs> That's true. Like I was eating things that I, I had in eight years. Like iron, iron yeah. is important. Uh, yeah. In fact, you had low iron and that was a potential cause of At your miscarriages. Two miscarriages. Yeah. I fixed my iron before this pregnancy. Uh, and I do think that helps with egg development. Uh, methylated folate. Yeah. Um, I take that all the time. The reason we say that is because a lot of people have an MTHFR polymorphism. Uh, it reduces your ability to, to create methylfolate. And you need methylfolate to prevent neural tube defects. And if you don't and, know your status, you should be taking that anyways. There's yeah. literally no downside from taking a methylated B vitamin, but there's potential risk if you don't know your status. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, also, and that gets back to homocysteine as well, which can contribute to clotting problems during pregnancy. And uh, when you lower the homocysteine, uh, the best way to do that's through taking methylated folate along with riboflavin B6 and B12. Um, yeah, I take quite a bit of B6 during pregnancy. Because it I helps think, with morning sickness. Yeah. Something like 25 milligrams three times a day, I think, yeah. for yep. morning sickness. Uh, if you're using that form, use the pyridoxal 5-phosphate or P5P uh, because the pyridoxine form, which is found in plant mm -hmm. foods, has been the only form that's associated with adverse effects like neuropathy with doses exceeding 25 milligrams per day uh, taken for several months, which, you know, is during pregnancy. Um, and uh, there's no downside to using P5P and potential avoidance of an adverse effect. So it just makes sense to do it from a precautionary standpoint. Yeah. Uh, uh, anything else about nutrition that you want to mention? No, I just think uh, getting enough protein in, enough carbs. I do think carbohydrates are very important for neural development of the baby. We only have animal studies, but <laughs> I mean, the, the little mice are like retarded when they're born, <laughs> when you deprive them of carbs. So I, I think that a lot of people are like advocating for ketogenic diets during pregnancy. And I think it's at your own risk kind of thing. Like you might end up with a baby with a birth defect. <laughs> Yeah. We I'll, just don't know. 
Also, I think something that's overlooked is that ketosis was a state that evolved to prevent starvation or prolong the amount of time we could go without food. Uh, reproducing is something that occurs when your body when thinks the, you have enough yeah, food. When the food is plentiful. Right. And um, nutrients. Glucose is a nutrient. Like my body does not convert very quickly yeah. <laughs> protein like it doesn't. Yeah. So yeah, I guess that's it. Just try to not, the thing with pregnancy is you just don't want to be over, overly restrictive. That's the worst thing you could do. Beyond that, it, it, pregnancy yeah. is about ensuring you get enough. Yeah, as a lot of women go into uh, pregnancy with eating disorders or ideas about their body and they don't like it changing and they start freaking out. <laughs> yeah. And that's when they start restricting. Yeah. Um, I've seen it happen a lot. <laughs> So you want to be careful. If you start doing that, then maybe it's time not to weigh yourself and let your doctor do it with you facing away. Yep. That's what we do when someone has an eating disorder. Okay. Anything else? Nope. I think that's it. All right, folks. That was our little talk about pregnancy, nutrition, and fitness, uh, kind of blending it in with our own experience on this journey. So if you like the video, awesome. That's what we're trying to do. Please give it a like. Uh, share it with a friend. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks guys. Bye.